Hello, everyone, and welcome to PMI Northeast Ohio Chapters COVID-19 fundraiser event. Um, this is our final session of our fundraiser event. And uh, if you missed any of the previous sessions, we plan on uploading all of those to our uh, chapters YouTube channel, so you can catch up on them over there. Um, today, we have our guest speaker, Jeff Tobe, who's here to talk to us about uh, leading in turbulent times. But before we get started, I wanted to remind everybody that these events are set up to support local communities in Northeast Ohio and, uh, that have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, all funds that are gathered through the donations are gonna be going to the Greater Cleveland COVID-19 Rapid Response Fund, um, which is uh, supported by the Cleveland Foundation. They have been involved in local community since 1914, and you can go on their website uh, to learn more about their COVID-19 initiative. I will be pasting the link in chat so you guys don't have to uh, worry about uh, copying that. You guys can click on the link once I send that out. Um, you guys uh, can also go to the uh, registration, uh, the page registration page to donate um, to the COVID-19 um, fund as well. Um, I will send these links out again so that you can go ahead and, and click. Uh, there is no amount that is too small and it's all going to a worthwhile cause. So please, go ahead and donate if you are able to. I also wanna remind everybody of a couple of ground rules before we get started. Um, as usual, we will be providing PDU codes um, towards the end of the presentation. I believe uh, this webinar entitles you to a one hour of leadership uh, PDU. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A feature or the chat. We will actively monitor both. Uh, we also record all of these webinars and we make them available on the YouTube channel, like I mentioned. So if you've missed any of the previous events um, that, that the chapter holds, you can go to the PMI Northeast Ohio's YouTube channel and catch up on those there. Finally, uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, at the end of the webinar, you will actually give, get a um, survey link uh, to provide your feedback. Please take some time and fill those in. The feedback is very useful. Uh, we use that to continue improving um, our events um, and coming up with new topics to hold uh, presentations on. Now, jumping over to the speaker, uh, Jeff Tobe, um, and I will keep this brief and I will let Jeff do most of the talk talking, but Jeff is a speaking professional. He has an extensive background at uh, speaking at a lot of different key events. Um, readers from the convention and meetings magazine put him alongside the likes of Bill Clinton and Anderson Cooper as their favorite speakers. So uh, alongside some great company there. Um, he's also been involved in numerous publications and is the author of the hugely popular book, Project Man Management Professionals Are the Coloring Outside the Line. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and let Jeff take over from here. So Jeff. Thanks, you. always. Uh, it's so nice to be here with and, and to be back with uh, PMI NEO. Um, I know that sometimes an hour presentation is kind of boring, so that's the last thing I want to do. We're going to use chat a little bit. I want to make sure that you all know how to use it. So um, first of all, let me let me introduce myself uh, a little more. Um, I, I just as background, I wear three different hats. And uh, the first one is this one. Uh, very proud of the fact that I am a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Now, let me explain. I grew up in Ontario, and um, it's, since 1967, I've been a very disappointed person. That's why now, uh, where I live, at least we have a better hockey team. Uh, where I live now, uh, I have to brag. You know, I know that uh, I am about to lose a lot of followers and friends in Cleveland area. I don't care. Yes, I, uh, I wear my Steelers hat very proudly living in Pittsburgh uh, and, and being a fan. But my most favorite hat that tells you the most about me is this one. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I can see people saying boo already, so thank you. Um, and, and with two daughters, and, um, and so I'm very proud of that. All right, let's use the, let's, I see some of you saying that you, you uh, heard me before, but uh, in the chat box, would you just put yes or no? Have you heard me speak before? No, no. Got a yes. And no, no, no. Um, 
Norma says, I don't really care to hear you at all. No, I'm not kidding. Just kidding. All right. So most of you have not heard. That's great. I can use the same jokes and the same lines. That's perfect. I, I'm excited. Now, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to talk about leading in turbulent times. So bear with me. Um, I hope that worked. Maybe you guys can tell me if, if uh, we're not able to see it yet. No, interesting. Okay, let me try that again. So you cannot see that? No, I cannot. Huh. Let me go back. Sorry. Uh, not the most technical, and of course, it works when we wanted it to. Share. There we go. I think that'll work now. There we go. All right, sorry. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, leading in, in turbulent times. And, you know, obviously so important right now, whether you're a leader or a prospective leader, this is not what I normally talk about, as most of you know who have heard me. I talk about the customer experience, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Customer meaning internal or external, obviously. Um, but before all this craziness happened, I was actually speaking uh, to a PMI chapter in Kuwait. And I, I came across this guy uh, wearing this t-shirt and I thought it was perfect to share with you. So if you don't have a t-shirt, I think you should find it because I, I really believe this. I, I'm not a project manager. Um, I have been around now for about five years. I've spoken to uh, 50 chapters worldwide. And, and I have to tell you that I truly believe you are a miracle worker sometimes for what you do. And, and it's really come, uh, for me, it's really helped me appreciate what you do. So why would I choose colored pencils as my, it's kind of my background. You know, one thing, if you don't know me, I'm all about coloring outside the lines, about getting outside your comfort zone and kind of looking at what you do from a different perspective. And I think now more than ever, we're gonna to have to do that, obviously. Uh, most of you are probably not back at, at work, meaning a physical location, and have had to figure out a, a lot of different things from technology to, um, uh, to how you do your job remotely. So we're going to look at, at today really about the balance between task and relationship. And so I, I put it on a graph because I know that, especially for the business analysts, uh, graphs are something you love because I'm coloring outside the lines. I have no clue what I'm doing, but there's a graph, I think. <laughs> and um, the bottom line at the bottom line at the bottom is relationship. And at the left, we'd have task. So, you know, where do you fall now and where should we be uh, as a leader or prospective leader? Well, if you're in the bottom left, that's basically low task, low relationship, meaning that you're not getting a lot done and uh, really not, don't really care about the people you work with. I hope you're not there. <laughs> the next one is the top left. That would be getting a lot of work done, but really not connecting with, uh, with other employees, with the people on your team, with stakeholders. Bottom right would be low task still, but high relationship. So not getting a lot done, but we have a good time doing it. <laughs> and the last one where we're going today is where I'd love to get you is the top right. Whoop. Is the top right, which is high task, high relationship. Okay, is this too analytical for you? Let me put it in other terms. <laughs> Let, let's say what song would represent each one of these quadrants in your minds. Well, low task, low relationship to me would be something like Hakuna Matata. And no, I'm not going to sing, but... Uh, you're all muted, muted, and if you choose to sing, please go for it. Uh, how about the top left? If you're high task, low relationship, what song? Ain't got any in mind? Well, I thought I did it my way. Good Frank Sinatra thing, right? High task, low relationship, we're going to do it up my way. Bottom right is low task, high relationship. I think you're catching on. You know what I did. You've got a friend in me, but we won't get anything done. But where we're going is high task, high relationship. And what's up in that quadrant? Let's get it started. So let's get it started today. All right, we're gonna talk about five steps for great uh, leadership in turbulent times. And you know, this graphic, I have to tell you, as silly as it sounds, the original graphic were literally five steps. And I realized that that's misleading. Um, I don't think any one of these steps comes first whether you're coming up, going up the steps or down the steps. Uh, I think it's very cir uh, circular. And I also believe that you can kind of jump in at any point. 
uh, in these five steps. So as we go through that, keep that in mind. Some of them, you know, I always say my job is to make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, that's what coloring outside the lines is all about. And so my job is to make you feel uncomfortable and some of these are gonna feel uncomfortable and that's okay. But at least try to force yourself to get outside your comfort zone a little bit and maybe look at some of these from a different perspective. So let's look at uh, step number one. And that's just reconsidering what I call the four C's of decision making. And what are the four C's? Uh, the four C's are uh, B, number one, we need to be clear. You know, uh, when the going gets tough, uh, leaders uh, get, uh, sorry, the best leaders uh, get crystal clear. And I made some notes. I'm not pretending I'm not looking at my notes, but uh, they get crystal clear in their communication. Uh, we have to retain that clarity to keep our organizations effective. Uh, one of the most important duties of a leader is the ability to look at complex data and kind of break it down into clear, specific, and actionable components to help steer the company vision and drive response. No matter the topic, uh, remaining clear is, as possible can be the difference between connecting with your organization to help them continue doing uh, great things or just confusing a capable group of people and, and hoping that they go in the direction that you want. Uh, Marcus Buckingham, I wrote down a saying, he's the author of the book, uh, Things You Need to Know About Great Managing, Great Leading, and Sustained Individual Success. And he said, effective leaders don't have to be passionate. They don't, have to, um, uh, they don't have to be charming. They don't have to be brilliant. What they must be is clear. So I think being clear is a key. Number two is being consistent. You know, well, I think the best lesson I can give you is a story. Many years ago, 32 years ago to be exact, when my wife and I got pregnant, a, a friend of my dad's came to me and gave me some sage advice. He said, you know, your kids will never, uh, sorry, You'll never know what your kids will say, what they'll do, or how they'll act in any given situation. But you must always know how, what you'll say, what you'll do, or how you'll act in any given situation with your kids. And I love that because it comes to mind when we're talking about leadership and being consistent. We really have to be consistent in, in their decision making all the time. It's almost like it, I, another word I may, might add would be congruent. Um, are we talking the talk? Are we walking the message, uh, 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 living the values of our team, of our organization? You know, I may have shown this when I was with some of you, but I, I was in Toronto uh, late last year, and I was speaking at a very large convention. I was the keynote speaker uh, to about 750, 800 people. And then I had to do a breakout later in the day. And my host said, during the day, you can go to any breakout that you want. So I saw this one, improve your efficiency with the latest technology. And I thought, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. Who wouldn't want to see that? So I opened the door to the room, and there were eight flip charts. Now, now you may not understand, but it was called Improve Your Efficiency with the Latest Technology. There are eight flip charts. This is not a consistent or congruent message. That's what I'm talking about. I also like to look for opportunities of, of signs that are incongruent. Here's one. Something wrong about that picture. I, I don't know what it is, but it just bothers me. <laughs> so, so that's what we're talking about with consistency. All right. The next one, the next C is being confident. And uh, being confident, just remember this. I like to say um, a boss creates fear. A leader creates and emanates confidence. The fourth C and final is be concise. Uh, you got to sound like a leader Think about what you say, when you say it, how you say it. Uh, whether you're a team leader or a senior executive, what you say, how you say, when you say it, and whether you say it in proper context uh, are critical components, especially now when we're working remotely. Uh, we may not have the, the added advantage sometimes of face-to-face -face, uh, by video. So now we're on an audio call and we have to be careful what we say and, and make sure it's concise. Uh, it's just important, and we need to let individuals know clearly what role you want them to play in the conversation. So those are the four C's and our first, our first step. All right, let's move on to the second step. We all have to accept that there's always, always, always more than one right answer for every single challenge that our customer brings us. Now, I use the word customer, and, and let me explain. Um, I believe that you all have two customers. You have an external customer, and who is that? That might be the, obviously your customer, the stakeholder, but internally, we, it's anybody without whom we can't do what we do every single day. 
And there's a bit of a, a paradigm shift. An example would be my UPS driver. You know, if he doesn't show up to pick up the parcels that I need him to on the days that I need him to, I'm out of business. So he's a vital part to doing what I do every single day. And there's a paradigm shift. We, we should be his customer, and I hope we are, but we treat him as an internal customer. So internally or externally, we have to understand there's always more than one right answer. And I think it comes down to perspective. If you have heard me before, you know that I talk a lot about perspective when I'm talking about customer experience. I once heard a, uh, a sales trainer say, if you see the world through your customer's eyes, you'll see the way your customer buys. And I love that. I, I really believe that we have to see the world right now through our uh, customer, internal and external, through their eyes, not ours. So when we look at perspective, uh, I, I like to say this. I think we have to give ourselves what I call an alternative solution kick, an ASK. It's when you find yourself saying, I've seen this a thousand times before, I know exactly what to do. That's when we have to say to ourselves, there's always, always, always more than one right answer for every single challenge my customer gives me. As a matter of fact, my wife and I were out for dinner last year and we were walking along a sidewalk in Pittsburgh and, uh, and we came across this sign in front of a sandwich shop uh, I think it's the second right answer. I'll, I'll let you read it. <laughs> See, now, I'm a marketing guy. So either this is great marketing or they're idiots. I, I don't know which one, but I think it's a great idea, and I'm going to try and figure out how to use it in my business. So we're talking about the second right answer. I want to introduce you, if I haven't before, and I apologize if this part is, is a little repetitive because it's so key to being an effective leader. I want to introduce you to a principle that's in my book, Coloring Outside the Lines, and call it the Harvey Principle. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the movie Harvey, Jimmy Stewart, but um, it's an old, old movie. And I watched it as a kid, took it at face value, very entertaining. But about 10 years ago, I rented it to watch with my family. And I watched it from a whole different perspective. Even if you have never seen the, uh, the movie, at the beginning of the movie, they want to commit Jimmy Stewart's character to a mental institution. He's obviously crazy. He's the only one who can see this six foot white rabbit that he's named Harvey. But watching from a different perspective by the end of the movie, I started to question whether or not he was the crazy one. Maybe, just maybe it was everybody who couldn't see Harvey who was crazy. And I started to think, how does that affect our, our professional lives? So I developed this theory. It's a whole chapter in the book. But the bottom line is this. It's learning to see invisible opportunities where everyone else sees only visible limitations. Let me say that again. Learning to see invisible opportunities where everyone else says it can't be done. Where everyone else said, uh, we tried that four years ago before you got here, it doesn't work. Where everyone else says, you can't do that in the project management profession. That's where the opportunities lie. That's where we have to train ourselves to look for that second right answer. Um, as a matter of fact, let me share this with you. I want to share with you uh, what I found. I, I was trying to figure out after all these years of working in project management, uh, why it's so hard for you guys mostly in general, and I'm generalizing, to see your Harvey, to look for that opportunity. Well, here's the thing, and I'm scared to even say this during, an, uh, during a pandemic, but, but the bottom line is I think it is a disease strictly in the project management world. Now, don't get me wrong. This disease cannot affect your health. It could only affect your leadership and your creativity. The disease I have fondly called PROMPIDS. <laughs> yeah. What does that stand for? It stands for Project Management Professionals Innovation Deficiency Syndrome. <laughs> you know, when I made that up at midnight last night, I thought it was a riot, but it's not that funny. But anyway, the point is this. I wanna share with you five symptoms. Five symptoms that if you uh, can uh, see these within your team or in your organization, and you can arrest them quickly, you're well on your way to being a more creative leader. The first symptom is what I call internal myopia. What's myopia? nearsightedness, right? It's, it's about being so focused on the challenges we have right now, we're not willing to step back and look at the big picture. And I'm telling you from experience from consulting with Fortune 500 companies down to mom and pop operations, those people, those organizations that are able right now to step back and look at the big picture, to look at the opportunities this pandemic is, is affording us, those are the ones who are going to uh, be successful in the future. And so we've got to stop being so myopic. On a bit of a story, many years ago, I was sitting reading my newspaper on a Sunday afternoon, just relaxing, reading the, the uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and I came across a full-color, full-page ad for the recreational vehicle show coming to Pittsburgh. 
Now, the RV show, I don't mean to insult anybody. If, if your dream is to retire one day and carry your house on your back, good for you. I don't understand this RV thing. What I do know is I know advertising. My background's in marketing and advertising. I know how much a full color, full page ad costs in the Sunday paper. So I turned the paper around to my wife who's sitting opposite me and I said, honey, look at this. What a waste of advertising. The RV show. Well, I, before I can even get my paper turned back around, my wife says from the other chair opposite me says, excuse me. And I'm thinking 35 years, I didn't know that you like RVs. That's not what she said. She said, Mr. Creativity himself coloring outside the lines. She said, um, you, don't you travel the world telling people to, you, uh, to feel uncomfortable? I said, yeah. She said, go. I said, go where? She said, go to the RV show. I said, I am not going to the RV show. <laughs> So when I was at the RV show, come on, you know, after 35 years, should have given you the hint, right? That RV show changed my life. Uh, you know, I, but uh, almost seven years ago now, uh, after that event, I, maybe even more, I, I dragged my family to Calgary, Alberta. We rented a 32 foot RV. We had the most incredible trip of our lives. I would like to buy one of these suckers. <laughs> Why? Because I, I had the opportunity to step back and stop being so myopic in my world. We need to stop being so nearsighted. All right, the second symptom of prompids is the ostrich syndrome. What does an ostrich do? It buries its head in the sand. And in our case, they pretend that change is not happening all around them. Well, it's so difficult uh, to do right now. And, and by the way, if you know anybody who suffers from this, there's only one part of their body left exposed. <laughs> Think about it. Number three, psychosclerosis. I don't know if anybody has a healthcare background, but this is hardening of the attitudes. And that's when you see somebody saying, you know, my way or the highway. We've never done that before. You can't do that here. Psychosclerosis. And I'm afraid as we get back to the new normal, whatever that is, that there's so many people that are still going to try and keep doing it the way it's always been done. And as a leader, a prospective leader, you've got to buy into the fact that that just doesn't exist anymore. And it gives us this opportunity to recreate what we do. Number four, feedback immunity. Are you immune to the feedback of your customer, internal or external? You know, obviously, we live in a customer service oriented environment. Uh, if I go, to, you know, if I buy something at Walmart and I, and I don't like it or, or you don't have what, or Walmart doesn't have what I want, I can go to um, Target. Uh, we have choices nowadays. It's no different with our people. They have choices too, and unless we're listening, even, even this feedback community, it's no longer will you listen to my feedback. I just expect you to listen to my feedback as a leader. Now I think the gauge is how quickly do you react to my feedback? How quickly do you call me back when I leave a message in your voicemail? It's, it's something as simple as that. We'll come back to that a little later, feedback community. And the last one, uh, last symptom of prom, prom Oh, promids, I keep saying prompids, but anyway, it, promids is that uh, it's not even an English word, I just like to say it, expertitis. It's when somebody knows so much about something, you can't teach them something new. If you find these symptoms in, in your organization, on your team, and you can arrest them quickly, you're well on your way to being more creative as a leader and looking for that second right answer. I've shown this before to you, but uh, I, do you all know it's simple as a logo on a truck going by, a van going by that you see every day? What's hidden in the FedEx logo? Many of you know, it's a giant arrow, on purpose, by the way. I'd love to see you right now. Um, you may be in the chat box. How about that? Would you put down yes or no? Have you ever seen that before? Always, oh, maybe you can help me. I'm not seeing it, so. It looks like there are mostly yeses, but there are a handful of noes, okay. and there are a couple of people who say their minds have been blown, so <laughs> I see a couple of people were not aware of that. I love it. I can't seem to go back for some reason. I would love to do that, but it's not going to work. I am frozen. Hmm. Bear with me. I'm way ahead of myself, but can't go backwards. So I'm going to. Uh, stop sharing. I'm sorry, everyone.
doesn't seem to want to. Oh, Ace, maybe you can let me know again when I when you see. Sure, I can let you know once it comes up for us. Um, yep, it's up. It's up. Okay. All right, good. I apologize to everyone. Sorry about that. Yes, anyway, let's go back to this. So, so a lot of you knew that it was there. And the bottom line is that, you know, now that for those of you who didn't, I have just driven you crazy because you will always see it. Um, I don't know why, but my slides are frozen. So um, we maybe have a bit of a trouble here. <laughs> um, let me think of how I can might be able to do this. It won't let me escape or end show. Forgive me, everyone. I, I don't know what's happening. I'm going to do this kind of manually. Let's see if it works. Looks like it's back up for us. There we go. I don't know what's, what happened. I apologize. Anyway, all right. I completely lost my train of thought. The bottom line is that you can't help but see it because your right brain is going to see it every single time. And most of you are trained with your left brain kind of read it and move on, read it and move on. But now that I've made you aware of what we call the opportunity, the white space, your brain will kick into it every single time. You know, I had the opportunity to speak in India a few years back and I showed this slide and afterwards a young lady came up and said, yes, but Mr. Tobe, what, what about the, uh, I'm so frustrated here. I don't know if you can hear that. That's me trying to advance. So. Um, are you sharing only the PowerPoint or are you sharing your whole screen? Maybe that is causing an issue. Okay. Um, I can't even get the, I'm really embarrassed. I'm sorry, everyone. Which one do you think I should do? <laughs> um, I think if you select um sharing your screen it should come up okay instead of selecting just the powerpoint how do i do that uh, okay let's try that okay now i think you can move your no all right maybe we have to work without it Um, I'm pretty, uh, sorry, I'm a little flustered now because <laughs> that's never happened. So uh, let's see if it works. Oh, never mind. I found another way, right? On the screen, there is a, a, an advanced button. <laughs> so, all right. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, that means we will be here till four o'clock. So hope no problem. Um, <laughs> All right, let me continue. The bottom line is that the young lady came up to me and said, what about the measuring spoon in the other E? I hope I've blown your mind again. Let me keep going. All right, number three, after, uh, except that there's always more than one right answer. Uh, we need to be a relationship manager, not a task manager. And so I think this is a key. Right now we're so uh, we're thinking about tasks that we have to think about how we manage the relationships and how we communicate. I think uh, right now we need to listen. Isn't that a gross picture, by the way? But we need to listen with our eyes and our ears. Uh, shattering the stereotype is about communicating in a way in which they need to be communicated to, if that makes sense. So I think the first thing that I wanted to talk about here, about being a relationship manager, is about understanding motivation. Um, again, in your chat box, and I'm hoping that you can help me again with, since I can't see it, um, I, I'd like you to put down, imagine that you're all, um, you all have a hundred people who work for you. How do you motivate them? Would you write just one or two words? How do you motivate the, your pe those people? Wait, maybe you can help me again. Oh, no. the, the couple of questions, the answers coming in is, uh, I, I clear. Sorry, they just came up. So it says clear goal. Yeah. Um, Got it. Know, Talk to them about what they think is motivational. Get to know what's important to them. I love that. Clear task. 
multitasking that they can relate to. See, now you're back to tasking again, you know? It's not about, this isn't about giving tasks, this is about relationship. So um, let, let me say, somebody said uh, appreciation, I love that. Let, let me take that one for a second. Appreciation is a great one. But under the umbrella of appreciation, there are two very different uh, people. There's, first there's me, I know myself. I am motivated by appreciation. Uh, and the more public, the better. Put my name in the newsletter. Tell me how great I am. Uh, tell everybody how great I am. Give me an award at the awards banquet. But some people are embarrassed by that, but still need appreciation. And I call that praise. Bob, thank you so much for being on the team. You're doing a great job. Bob may be embarrassed to make a public, but he still needs you to thank him once in a while. Uh, some people are motivated by the challenge. Somebody said that. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, give me the challenge. Give it to me. I'll prove to you. Almost like a competition. Um, some people, and I especially find in your profession, are motivated by doing it right. I'm analytical, I'm detailed oriented. Give it to our team, we'll do it right. All right, none of those are the right answer, but thank you for your contributions. <laughs> the American Marketing Association did a study in 2018, and to 50,000 workers uh, in diverse industries around the US and Canada, they asked that question, what motivates you? And the number one answer, which was 47% uh, above number two, by the way, which was incentive, I forgot to mention that, a huge motivator, uh, money or whatever that is. The number one motivator, incentive was number two. Number one was fear. Fear, not like, ooh, ah, scared fear, but fear of, um, uh, uh, of loss of stability. I, I'm motivated to work from eight to five because I can't afford to lose my job. So I want you to think this thing called motivation and motivating people is not always a positive thing. As a matter of fact, I like to say that there are uh, four rules about, uh, of motivation, if you will. Uh, number one, so I'm not used to using that word, is you can't motivate anyone. And now, here's a challenge because I'll get, you know, I'll be out in public when I used to go out in public and sit on an airplane, remember those days? Um, and somebody will say to me, what do you do for a living? I'll say, I'm a professional speaker. They go, oh, you're a, what, motivational speaker. And I would cringe a little because I don't believe there is such a thing. See, my job as a speaker, trainer, uh, communicator, consultant is no different than your job as, as a business analyst or as a project management professional. My job is to create an environment, no matter the medium, to create an environment in which people are motivated to go do something, but I can't motivate them. Your job should be the same. Your job should be to create the environment in which people are motivated to go do what you need them to do, but you can't motivate them. The second rule is that everyone is motivated. Ever have that in any of your jobs in the past? You walk in and, and there's, uh, there's John. Every morning, John sits there with a cup of coffee, feet up on the desk, reading his newspaper and, uh, or looking at his tablet nowadays, right? And, and you turn to somebody and say, what are we gonna do with John? He, he's just not motivated, he doesn't do anything. Oh yes, he is. John is motivated to sit there and do nothing. Unless you're dead, you're, right now you are motivated to think about what you have to do this afternoon, to think about what you just had for lunch or going to have. You're motivated. Everyone is motivated unless they're dead. So the third rule and most important as an effective leader in today's uh, world is that understand that everyone is motivated for their reasons, not yours. You know, ladies, um, when was the last time you went out and said, I want to be sold a new dress? Ever? Guys, when was the last time you went out and said, I want to be sold a new tie? Ever? No, what do we say? I need to buy. I want to buy. I'm not here for sales training. That's not the point. But you have to understand that, um, that if I tell salespeople all the time, stop selling. You just need to, uh, uh, to present your ideas, your concepts, your product, your service to me in a way in which I'll buy into it, not a way in which you've been used to selling it. And this is key for leadership today. We have to understand our people so well that we can kind of present our ideas, our concepts to them in a way in which they need to be presented to, not a way in which we've always presented. And the last rule is that if I know more about you than I have before, I can manage the situation. It simply means that I might have worked with you for years, but I don't know what motivates you. And until I do, I can't work with you in a way in which you need to be worked with. All right, I know we're flying a little bit, but I got to make up for some time. So um, I think that, uh, whoop, can't see it there. I won't, I don't know, a blank slide, but that, that should uh, say uh, communication on it. And I think communication is key. 
Um, you know, years ago, I, uh, I, I used to think that uh, there was only one way, a uh, great way to communicate. Many years ago, I uh, discovered this. Not sure if everybody's familiar with it. It's a behavioral styles or a personality profile. And I thought it was the be all and end all. In other words, if I could understand your personality, your behavioral style at work, I could work with you in a way which you need to be worked with. And then uh, about uh, seven, eight years ago, I, I was sitting in a hotel room one night and um, I got bored. I didn't want to watch another television show. So I walked over to my computer and I registered, I enrolled in my master's degree. Now we're talking about communication. This is probably not something you want to do without consulting your significant other first, all right? But anyway, I enrolled in my master's degree in, uh, in um, education and I focused on adult communication. And um, I came to realize very quickly that understanding your personality and behavioral style was only one obstacle. It was only one uh, tool that I could use. Uh, but another one uh, came up very quickly. It's this one. Another obstacle is that there's a, very, there's a difference between man and woman, right? Now, guys, don't get insulted. We're just a little less sophisticated, that's all. But this graphic goes way back. 1995 was the year, and it goes back to a, a great book. And I'll, say, I'll tell you why I think it was great. But the book was called what? Men are from Mars, Women are from Venus by John Gray. And it was great because at the time, it was the only book that a psychologist has ri had written about the communication differences between man and woman, gender-based. Well, it's no longer that way. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> I, I doing my research and, and then doing my thesis exactly on this, well, all the work now is not on gender-based. It's on female, uh, female brain, male brain. What, what does it mean very simply is that we all have female brain and male brain, every one of us. And depending on how we react to a situation, it's either female brain or male brain. If uh, a man says, okay, let's sit down and talk about this, that's female brain. If a woman says, okay, look, bottom line is we need to just fix this and move on, that's male brain. But we all have a combination of each. So now if I can start to understand how you react in situations, male brain or female brain, I can work with you differently. But it does go back to this, you know, um, John Gray said that men are wired to do only one thing, and, and that is to fix it and move on, right? And I got to tell you that my new book I think I'm going to write is Project Management Professionals Are From Mars. Why? Because that's how you're wired. You hear a problem, let's fix it and move on. And, and instead, what I'd say we need to do is kind of step back and ask ourselves, uh, uh, ask our people questions. It's not just about fixing it and moving on. All right. So when we talk about communication, I think we need to listen with our eyes and our ears. You know, people communicate in so many different ways. Every study shows there are only three things that make us an effective communicator. Our words, our tone of voice, and our body language. And if you're wondering about the percentage, uh, if that were 100% of our effectiveness, here's what the studies say. That, um, forget, had to prove, that only 10% of the words we use, 30% is our tone of voice, 60% is our body language. You know, what message uh, are you giving your team as a leader that's not coming out of your mouth? And so it's so important to understand this, that when we talk about effective leadership, and especially now when we're doing it remotely, um, it, you know, if this is, if this is true, then, um, let me see, then we have to, sorry, if, if this is true, it's working again, I'm so excited. Uh, then we have to start thinking about that, that body language that we give, and I can prove it to you. Um, if you bear with me, I am not a singer, nor do I have a voice. You may even want to plug your ears, but I'm going to sing you the most uh, popular uh, bedtime, uh, uh, bedtime uh, song in, worldwide in every language, Rockabye Baby, the fast version. Rockabye Baby in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come baby, cradle and all. Shh, baby sleeping. You ever thought about the words of this thing? Rockabye baby, we're going to put you in a tree? Why we're putting you up there is a mystery to me. The wind's going to blow like a hurricane or a tornado. And the branch you're on is going to break? You're going to fall and probably die. Good night. What's with that? Think about it, it has nothing to do with our words that we're using. Almost 100%, it's our body language and our tone of voice. What message are you giving your people that's not coming out of your mouth? You are a good sports just for not leaving, I see. Most of you didn't leave during that, so good. Let's go on. The second thing is that we have to understand as a leader that ambiguity is reality. 
You know, I don't know how many of you have English as a second language, but it's got to be a tough language to learn because we have so many meanings depending on context in the English language. And so we have to understand that ambiguity is reality. Here's a, um, I don't know what you call this, an urban myth, I think they call it. I found it online. I don't even know if it's true, but I love it because it proves my point. Supposedly, this was written by an 88-year-old consumer. Last year, I replaced several windows in my house, and they were the expensive, double-pane, energy-efficient kind. But this week, I get a call from the contractor complaining that his work's been completed for a whole year, and I get to pay for them. Boy, oh boy, do we go round. Just because I'm old doesn't mean that I'm automatically stupid. So I proceeded to tell him just what his fast-talking sales guy told me last year. He said that in one year, the windows would pay for themselves. <laughs> there was silence on the other end of the line, so I just hung up and I haven't heard back. Guess I must have won that silly argument. Yeah, ambiguity is reality. If this is true, what are the two most dangerous tools we have at our disposal today? Dangerous communication tools? Yeah. Email and texting. Why? Because the minute you sit down and you start to type, the minute you start to thumb, what's happened? We've lost 60% of our body language. We've lost 30% uh, of our tone of voice. We are now down to the words we use. And we better make sure that the words we use are the words we want the recipient to understand. So just keep in mind that ambiguity is reality. I hope everybody's doing okay, and I hope I'm not going too quickly. But I wanted to share with you a technique, if I could. I, I really wanted to give you a tool. And, and I, to understand that your customers always have two mountains to climb. And the two mountains um, may seem a little fluffy, but to me, after having done this now for over 25 years, they are key, the key, I think, to leading in turbulent times. Um, first of all, I hope you know that all your, uh, all your customers, internal or external, only listen to one radio station in the Ohio area, right? The radio station is WWI, sorry, WIIFM, what's in it for me? <laughs> yeah, and once we understand that, we start to see the world from their perspective. So the first mountain is to be listened to. We have to let our people know that we're listening. Now that sounds fairly simple, but most of us are not great listeners. We didn't grow up being taught how to listen. We grew up being punished for not listening. Didn't you hear a word I said? Aren't you listening to me? So we think we're not good listeners, but the good news is it's a skill. It can be learned. So I wanted to give you a tool. When you face a problem, when somebody brings you a problem on your team, no matter the problem, Instead of fixing it, which is our instinct, here's what you need to do. Here's what we need to do. Even the questions we ask are all about fixing it. I want you to ask a very simple question. It might make you feel a little uncomfortable, but I want you to try it. The question is what effect? What effect? So they bring you a problem. Um, look, the supplier who is bringing us whatever means they, they're delayed by three weeks, which means that we are going to be late in, the, in this uh, in the project. Um, in the deadline, uh, for the deadline. Right away we start saying, get on the phone, do this, do that. Instead, what effect is that gonna have on the team? What effect will that have on, my customer, on the customer? All you've done is taken it a step deeper and you're saying to them, I'm listening. And, and it's a, a very powerful, powerful question. Uh, and especially when we want our people to understand that we're listening. But the second mountain is even harder. The second mountain, uh, what effect by, uh, it helps you, it simply helps you sort of prioritize. But the second mountain is that you have to let people know that you understand. And this is a tougher one. The two words that I'm going to share with you that start a question are probably um, one of the two of the toughest words, uh, uh, but the most practical in the English language to get buy in from our customer and to let them know that we understand. Here are the blanks. Uh, in the chat box, anybody want to guess what they stand for? The two most powerful words to start a sentence, a, a question. I'm watching the chat box. Not much, not much action. <laughs> there's a couple, there's a help couple <laughs> requests. Yeah. Help ah, me. What Todd if Jones. Todd Jones is the first one. So I'm going to give him credit. Thank you. Not what is, but what if, right? What if, what if thing is the most powerful tool you can use if used properly. I'm going to take you quickly through a series of what if, and they'll tell you, you know, how it can change the way you work with each other. Um, uh, if, if I, at its very basic level, what if he does one simple thing? It shatters the stereotype of the experience your customer expects to have with you, but it's sequential. In other words, it has to follow, uh, it has to follow the what effect question. 
So the way it works, and I'm sorry, I'm rushing and I'm not going to get, in, get into too much detail. This is a half day workshop. I was going to try and put in in 10 minutes, but we don't have time. I want to take your questions and have time for that. The bottom line is this. It starts with a problem. The next question is, what effect is that going to have on your family? What effect is that going to have on the project? What effect will that have on our customer? And then we follow up with what if, because what ifing always opens a dialogue. Well, what if we did this? And, they, and someone says, no, 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 we can't do that, but what if we just did this? Okay, well, what if we did that, but we did... So what happens is it's back and forth, back and forth, until we, when, when we leave, someone says, man, they really listen to me, and I really enjoy working with them. Why? Because it, we got buy-in, we opened up a dialogue. And, and you don't wanna open up a dialogue when it's not appropriate, I understand that. But this is sequential, as I said. See, here's the challenge. Most people that I teach this, uh, this sort of method or system to, where they end up telling me that it didn't work. And when I probe a little deeper, what I find out is they, somebody brought them a problem and they said, well, what if we did this? See, uh, going back to those behavioral styles and, and uh, personality styles, there are three of the four styles who will say to themselves, oh, you just had an answer and all you did was put what if in front of it. So you must add the what effect question. So uh, supplier is going to deliver late. What effect is that going to have on our customer? And then, and then listen to the answer. It will start inevitably with something like, well, I hadn't really thought about it, but, or um, now that you mention it, so all we did was take it one step deeper and you come back and say, okay, what if we did this and open up a dialogue? I hope that makes sense. And, and like I say, it was a half day workshop, but what if simply helps you explore the possibilities and come up with mutual solutions every time and truly be an effective leader of relationships. All right, number four is become a storyteller. And this is the one that will probably feel a little uncomfortable. Uh, I think that right now, especially as a leader, we need to collect stories of, of humor, of humanity, of generosity to share with our staff and customers. Uh, quick story. I asked the CEO of an insurance company with whom I've been consulting on customer experience for the last year to send an email to seven, uh, 700 plus employees who are all working remotely. And I, um, in the email, I wanted him to ask if, if they would participate in a voluntary project just to keep a daily record of their lives during these unprecedented times. You know, they can't just pop up over a cubicle and talk to their neighbor, or they can't sit around the uh, uh, proverbial water tank, <laughs> whatever it's called, and, and water cooler and share stories. So I, I wanted to see, and I'd never done this before, I wanted to see how it worked. It was, it was incredible. incredible. I, I suggested that everyone keep a record, and it doesn't matter in any different form that they wanted. And believe me, the results were uh, brought laughter, uh, they brought tears and wonder. Employees jumped on the idea. They started uh, submitting stories. They started uh, submitting paintings that they had done. They, somebody submitted their kids' drawings. Uh, they did haikus and poems and, and songs, those who were talented and even some who weren't talented. Uh, so much so that the CEO had to establish an internal newsletter just for these crazy times so that people could check in on one another. You know, um, one of the people, and I wrote it down, one of the employees wrote, thank you so much for sharing this. I know that my furlough, so they're not even an employee right now, I know that my furlough and many others in the same position seem trivial compared to the trials and tri tribulations that some of our fellow teammates are enduring. It's vital that we stay connected. I love that. It's our job as a leader to make sure not only that we're communicating, but also by through our stories that we're keeping people connected. All right, the last, uh, the last of our five is simply engage your people at a different level. You know, I, if you've been with me before, you know I talk a lot about engagement. And I think that uh, customer experience and engagement are inextricable. As a matter of fact, I'll go through these quickly, but in my book, Anticipate, knowing what customers need before they do, we set up 10 uh, factors, 10 steps, if you will, to designing and implementing the ideal customer experience. I'll just focus quickly on engaging our customer internal and external. You know, to engage our customers, there's all kinds of ways to do it. And, and a bunch of brands here in the States have done a great job. But what, and how have they done it? By turning anticipate moments, or what we call touch points, into anticipate moments. What's a touch point? If, if you were to give me a, a, a definition, you know, what would you say a touch point is? Well, I define it as this, any opportunity we have to influence the customer experience. 
And I'm gonna give you an exercise right now in the next two minutes that I'd love for you to do with your team. This exercise, I can guarantee, will get people more engaged because the more engaged your team is internally, the better the experience externally. The thing is, they must have this definition that's on the screen. You might wanna take a picture. When you're doing the exercise though, all you need is this definition and a flip chart, an easel with paper and markers. And to give your people this and ask them, what are our touch points in any given day as a team, as an organization? And then start writing down every touch point you hear. At first, it's like pulling teeth. You're gonna hear marketing things like our on hold message, a business card I hand somebody, our website. But then it gets more, it gets into proposals or uh, an invoice we send somebody. Or how about this, I have to come to your office and I can't find a parking spot, touch point. I go into the men's room and it's dirty, touch point. We have hundreds of touch points in any given day. And it, like I say, at first it's like pulling teeth, write down every one. And as people start to get it, you'll end up with about 25 to 35 touch points. And, and, here's what, and then you take a break and tell everybody, you're on the honor system, I want you to come up and get a marker and put a checkpoint, a check mark beside the top five priority touch points for our team or for our group. See, I believe that engagement starts from the bottom, grassroots, and works its way up in a team or an organization, not from management and works down. Quick case history, I worked with Shadow Milk Company, we did this exercise, 65 people strong. Uh, when they came back, no surprise, they identified their drivers, their pickup and delivery of milk as the number one uh, priority in the organization, took the drivers aside. I said, what's one thing we could do to tweak, to make better this one touch point called pickup and delivery? Without hesitation, one of the drivers said, well, when I tell people what I do or what I say, or what I do or where I work, um, I get a bit of a giggle. So I wondered if we could use this somewhere in the organization. Guess what? At the bottom of every, uh, at the back of every shadow milk company truck, it now says this, in case of accident, please have cookies ready. Lots and lots and lots of cookies. <laughs> All right, so you pull up behind, you laugh a little bit, but what do you think the driver, not of this truck, what do you think the driver of the, in the group who suggested it, what do you think he's saying to everybody he knows? That's right, that's my idea, and look, it's on the back of every truck. Do you think he's, he's satisfied at work or do you think he's engaged? He's engaged. Your job as a leader right now is to get your people more engaged in what they do every day. So there you have it. The four, first, reconsider the four C's of decision making. Second, accept that there's always more than one right answer. Third, be a relationship manager, not a task manager right now. Four, be a story collector. And five, engage your people at a different level. Let me just finish uh, by saying uh, thank you. I'm gonna take some questions. I have an offer for you and please listen carefully. If you will, send me an email with the subject line PM book, project management book. Um, I'm gonna send you the PDF of my book for $10. Now understand something, it's just the PDF. It's not a Kindle version or anything else. It's even I, probably songs or without cover, but I will donate the entire $10 to the relief fund. Uh, that Waze was telling you about at the beginning. So if you're interested and you haven't got it yet, I will send you the PDF, uh, I'll, send me your phone number, I'll call you, get your credit card information, and the $10 I collect, well, the entire amount, I'll donate the, to the relief fund. I think it's so important right now. So Waze, I'm gonna open it up to you, and uh, any questions that we can gather in the last, what, about three minutes? <laughs> no, seven minutes. Yep, we just have a couple more minutes and I uh, just want to make sure we have, um, we're mindful of everybody's time. Um, there are no more questions as of now, but we'll give people, you know, a few minutes just to see if there's a few that trickle in. Okay. Um, it, while, while we do that, why don't I go ahead and uh, take over the presentation and I can go over uh, some of the closing remarks, remind everybody about the links and uh, share the PDU codes as well. Are you okay? Can you see? Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. No I'm, questions, I'm let shocked. Me know, uh, <laughs> let me know when you guys, uh, if you're able to see my screen here, Jeff. We can see it. Okay, so um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, the, the link to donate is in the event, um, event site. So please go ahead and click the donate button if you guys are able to. Um, just, it goes to a really great cause and um, 
any help is appreciated. Um, with that being said, um, here is the PDU information. Um, as I mentioned, this entitles you to one hour of leadership. I want to thank Jeff um, for such a great overview on leading in turbulent times. I know we had some technical difficulties. Uh, that's always a risk. Mm. We know, I know we've faced them in the past, so thank you for working with those. I'm glad that we were able to overcome those. Um, I hope that everyone found that as insightful as I did. I know there's a lot that, um, there's a lot to take away from that and uh, there's a lot of useful information and all of that. So again, uh, we really appreciate the time and effort uh, put into the presentation and Jeff, thank you for coming in uh, and talking with us. And um, thanks for uh, coming to the PMI Northeast Ohio webinar. My pleasure. And like I say, even if you're not ordering a book and you want to email me with questions or comments, jeff at jefftobe.com, I'm always uh, available. Yeah. And um, once again, um, just want to remind everybody to please go to the link and donate uh, if possible. Um, and with that being said, uh, that's all we had for today. Uh, stay safe and have a great rest of your afternoon. And um, Hope to catch you guys in future PMI Northeast Ohio webinars. Keep coloring outside the lines. Have a good weekend, everybody.